Good morning. Thanks for having me. Um, what I wanted to do, since I had a 45-minute opportunity, was to do sort of like, thank you, um, three 15-minute kind of TED Talk style sessions. Okay, they're all connected. My husband said they're not really different, and they're not. But the first 15 minutes is on smarter screening, if I stay on track. The second 15 minutes is on conducting interventions that are higher yield. And the last 15 minutes is what I, is all brand new. And when Dave and I, Dave Tilly and I write the new Pitfalls book, this will be a lot of the content. It, it really represents some of what we have learned about, oh, our failures, <laughs> how we have stubbed our toes, and some of the, maybe the softer skills that uh, have to come back to psychology to help, school psychology to help us uh, get people to do what works. We know how to go do it. We want to get other people to go do it with us. So, all right, so the first part is smarter screening. Um, we, Reynolds said in, in, gosh, 1975, that assessment ought to be about making a difference and not just a prediction in the lives of children. And in fact, the assessment that we do is, is very useful. We know that formative assessment, especially uh, in, in the, the last 20 years, formative assessment is something that has one of the strongest effect sizes on academic achievement around of all of the things that we compare. So assessment is a good thing. And yet, we make three classic errors when we conduct assessment as school psychologists. First, we assess when we already know the answer. We, when we're not sure about the answer, we collect more information concurrently using highly correlated measures and act as though that's gonna make us more accurate in our decision, which it doesn't, it just costs us time. And then finally, perhaps because of this overzealous assessment that we do, we end up with schools drowning in data and the same children are not learning to read. And probably we teach people to ignore the data because we collect too much of it. So to be smarter about screening, I want to demystify screening accuracy for you and show you where it comes from. So when a publisher says this is really a, a, an accurate screening tool, I want to show you how that works. It all begins with a scatter plot. And every dot on the x-axis is a child's performance on the high stakes test. And every dot uh, is a child on the uh, y-axis on the screening score. So to this, this criterion we cannot move. And when children score to above this criterion on the high stakes test, or below this criterion on the high stakes test, they, they've failed. And when they score above it, they've passed. And we're trying to use a screening tool to make a prediction. Well, we can move this screening bar up and down. This criterion can change. And children who score above whatever criterion we set are predicted to pass, and children who score below are predicted to fail. Now, what we're really trying to do is maximize the number of cases that fall into the correct decision quadrants. It all begins with a scatter plot. This demystifies it, right? So the correct negative cases are the kids in that top right quadrant who were predicted to pass who did pass, and the bottom quadrant are kids who were predicted to fail who did fail. These are the false negative errors. These are children that the screening said they're going to pass, they're going to do fine, and in fact they failed. Usually in screening we are trying to avoid these types of errors. So these are the false positive errors. These are kids that we said are going to fail but actually passed. Now, the point that I want you to see here is if you want to make fewer false negative errors, you got to move the bar up. But look what happens when you move the bar up. You're going to make more false positive errors, a lot more false positive errors. So where you set that bar determines how, and, and that's flexible. You can make that decision as a test user, and this is all in the world people do when they run a rock analysis and report what sensitivity and specificity is. The other thing I hope you noticed is that all the error occurs at the cut points. Did you see that? All the error is right at the cut score. Now, there are only four boxes. There are only four quadrants. You saw them. So if you see a screening measure that has three categories of risk, and it says definitely not at risk, some risk, or maybe at risk, and definitely, definitely at risk, then that is, that is a measure that will probably be less accurate in the real world, and I'll tell you why. Because when somebody does that, it's possible that they have removed the cases in the middle 
from the analyses. And they are reporting the accuracy estimates based upon being definitely not at risk, definitely at risk, and they're ignoring the cases in the middle. But we just said, that's where all the error is. And here's the other thing. You probably knew who these kids were before you screened. You probably knew who these kids were before you screened. And so, in fact, why are we screening? We're screening because we don't know what to do with the in-the-middle kids. So here's the thing. We cannot ignore the risk that people bring into assessment. And we do this all the time. It's kind of a, it's, it's time for us to evolve this practice. If you walk into an emergency department, you have two individuals, and both have the very same symptoms, crushing chest pain. And on the one hand, you've got a 65-year-old male smoker who is overweight, the probability that that person is really having a heart attack is displayed in the red there. Now, same symptoms, okay? Same CBM score, if you will. But on the right, you've got a 30-year-old female non-smoker who is normal weight. The probability that that individual is really, really having a heart attack is so low that it should, it absolutely should affect what you choose to do to screen and determine whether or not you need to do more assessment. Let me, let me uh, tell you why. If you do a test on the one on the left and the test comes back that says, nope, there's no heart attack. If there are, if there are false negative errors associated with that test, which there always are, you, you're not gonna stop. You're not going to say, okay, fine, you must be okay, because that person's probability of having a heart attack is so high that it's more likely that your test is wrong. So when we, when we ignore the risk that people bring to assessment, and we conduct assessment when we already know the answer, then all we are doing is inviting error. This happens every year. My husband's an ER physician, and they, they have these kinds of things happen for real. And he will call me, and he'll say, oh, your favorite thing has happened. You're not going to believe it. It's happened again. And so a positive pregnancy test in a male happens every year. You know why? You don't give a pregnancy test to a male because you already knew the answer. The test can only give you bad information. And yet, we do this. When we're giving academic screening measures to kids who receive special education services, guess what? We already know the answer. They're at risk. We, even if they pass the screening, their risk is so high that they're still going to fail the urine test, that they're still not going to learn to read, that in fact, we need to really remove them from that place and go ahead and, I, I don't mean from the physical place, remove, them, remove the question mark over their head and assume that they need intervention and go ahead and figure out how to provide that. Academic risks we should not ignore in screening. Prior referral or identification. That's a big one. When somebody has raised a red flag about a kid, usually there's a reason. There's a reason that there is a concern. A recent move, especially from a lower achieving district or state, special education eligibility, in some contact text, some of the demographic uh, factors or independent risk factors, and always, always class-wide, grade-wide, or school-wide proficiency problems. Okay, so back to our scatter plot. Remember, there's only four quadrants. And the way it works is the number of cases that are correct negatives go here. The number of cases that were correct positives go here. The number of cases that were false positive errors go there. And the number of cases that were false negative errors go there. And from those values, we calculate sensitivity and specificity. And from those values, we calculate everything else. So hopefully it's a little bit demystified for you that it all begins with a very simple scatter plot. Regardless of you're doing a regression analysis or a rock or whatever, it all can be boiled down to a very simple scatter plot and a contingency table that looks like this. Now, here's the takeaway point on this. Um, sensitivity, by definition, only is computed based upon the real positives, the kids who are going to fail, the people who really have cancer, okay? The uh, specificity is only computed on people who are going to pass, they're going to do fine, they really don't have cancer. The problem is when you are screening, you don't know yet which category somebody's going to be in right, for the in-the-middle kids. So sensitivity and specificity are really properties of a test, and so what we want to do is combine these two, and lucky for you, there is a metric that does it, and it's called post-test probabilities. And this is what 
we should be asking publishers to give us. The post-test probabilities, let me tell you what that is. A post-test probability is the probability when I have a failed screening that I'm really going to go on to fail the high stakes test given my risk factors. Okay? Medical analogies always work. So I have a positive finding on a mammogram. What are the chances that I really have cancer? And there are probably some things you want to know about me, like have I had cancer before? And how old am I? And do I smoke? Right? Those are, those are independent risk factors. This is a smarter way to screen. This is a threshold model that says, for the kids who we really knew who they were before we, before we screened and we really knew they were going to be okay, then we're going to say those kids, we don't do anything with them. We take them out. Um, for the kids who are definitely at risk, we know who they are before we screen often, then those kids, we're going to go ahead and provide intervention no matter what the assessment tells us. Okay, have you ever been to the doctor in the middle of flu season with flu symptoms and had the doctor tell you, I don't need to do the test, I'm going to presume you have the flu because it's more, there's so much flu going around and you have these symptoms that if I give you the test and it comes back negative, I'm more likely to be wrong than right. So I'm going to go ahead and presume you have the flu. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and presume that some kids need intervention. There's a class-wide problem with if the scores are low, if the, if the year-end high-stakes test scores from the year before are low, we're going to go ahead and provide intervention. And it's the in-the-middle kids for whom we want to do the assessment. All right, now let me show you the second mistake that we make. Collecting more of the same information at the same time doesn't help us make more accurate decisions about kids. These data come from Pennsylvania, and these are post-test probabilities. So for oral reading fluency with third graders and in a sample in Pennsylvania, 8% uh, of kids who passed the screener went on to fail the high-stakes test, and this, this screener's oral reading fluency, and 47% of kids who failed the screener went on to fail the high-stakes test. All right, this is what Mays looked like. 12% of kids who passed the screener went on to fail the high-stakes test at the end of the year, and 46% of kids who failed the screener went on to fail the high-stakes test. Um, this is a measure called Foresight. It's an individually administered one hour per kid assessment, and it does help us. You know, if you fail that, you're, you're pretty likely going to fail the high-stakes test, but it doesn't help us really with the rule-out decision any more than oral reading fluency. So what I want you to notice is the cost. Are you able to make better rule-out decisions as a result of collecting all three? No way. So one thing we should do is just use one. Just choose one. And when we make that choice, and I don't really care which one you choose, I want, I want people to do it with their eyes open about how much time it takes. So oral reading fluency is one minute per kid. Maze is three minutes per kid, but you can do it as a group. So it can be very, very efficient. And this for the same 100, if we're pretending we have 100 kids, this would be 100 hours. And you miss more kids. So 100 hours of assessment versus 100 minutes. OK. Now, the other thing is if we change the base rate, which we can do with intervention, then we can suddenly have a screening tool that becomes very accurate for us, okay? So if we move the amount of red, that the amount of risk that people bring into the assessment, if we change that with intervention, we can make what looks like a crummy screener become very effective. So this is the, these are the post-test probabilities for kids in, who receive free and reduced lunch in, uh, in a district in Massachusetts. And this is, this is a useless test. We can't rule anybody out. Kids who pass our screener, this happens to be a math screener, I won't say which one, 44% um, of those kids go on to fail the high stakes test. Why? Because their risk was so darn high. It was a flu epidemic. I mean, their risk was so high before we started that no measure can function in that context. Now we go in and provide intervention, we change the base rate. Now only 15% of kids are in the risk range, the real risk range according to our year-end criterion. And now the same measure becomes very useful. So only 6% of kids who pass it will go on to fail, so we can easily rule out kids. And in fact, six, uh, the, the pot, on the other side, the failed screener is 57%. So if they, if they fail the screener now, 57% of kids will go on to fail the high-stakes test. So that is a very, becomes a very useful tool. Okay, so smarter screening means consider cost, don't, over, don't collect multiple concurrent measures that don't help you uh, make more accurate decisions.